This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. I'm going to pull from a presentation, a recent presentation. No big intro, dive right in. It's a trend-following presentation, of course, that's what the hell I do. Three footnotes to this presentation, since you will not see visuals, and visuals are not needed, you will get a tremendous amount out of this, even if you don't have the visuals, and you don't have the visuals. So no complaining, but it's still cool stuff. But the three footnotes. I talk about a picture early on, around the five-minute mark, of a guy who's sitting there. Well, it's a guy sitting in front of like 15 monitors. I think by now everyone knows that if you're sitting there each day in front of 15 monitors, that's just mental masturbation. That's ridiculous. Number two, I talk about a guy named Nicholas Darvis, and I refer to him as a dancer. Now, you can go Google Nicholas Darvis, and you can find out that he was indeed a dancer who happened to be a trend-following trader who happened to be featured in Time Magazine at one point in time for his trend-following trading while he was a professional dancer. Oh, when was this? The 1950s. What does the 1950s have to do with today? Oh, right, it can't possibly be related today because nothing that took place yesterday, no strategy from decades ago could possibly be useful for you today. Yes, just a touch of sarcasm. And last but not least, I refer to several times in this presentation a track record, Bill Dunn's track record. Bill Dunn, who is featured in my book, Trend Following, I refer to the Dunn Capital track record. The Dunn Capital track record, which goes back over 40 years, pretty damn cool. You can check that track record out, and I'm no promoter for Dunn other than proof of concept, but you can check that track record out on my website at trendfollowing.com slash performance. So let's jump right in to an excerpt from one of my most recent presentations. No one can force the market to give you money. It just doesn't happen that way. We can only receive from the market what the market is willing to give to us. That's a pretty big point. I mean, so many people think they can pony up to the market, whatever market that might be, and demand money. It just doesn't work that way. And one of my favorite guys, going back to the 1700s, David Ricardo, he knew this back in the day. He knew. He absolutely knew that he could not force anything. And what he knew, one of these great precepts, but Ricardo was the first one, very first one, cut short your losses, let your profits run on. That is telling you, beyond a shadow of a doubt, you can't control a damn thing. All you can do is let the market be the market and you control what you can control, and that's you. That's the bottom line. Now, today I'm going to dig into a topic that some of you probably know a little bit about. Maybe you don't know anything about. Trend following. It goes by many names. In the professional world, it's often called managed futures. You'll hear about commodity trading advisors. These terms that mean absolutely nothing, invented by organizations, by regulatory authorities, but they don't describe the strategy. Managed futures, that's just telling us we're trading futures. That tells us nothing about the strategy. Now, historically, the vast majority of managed futures strategies, the vast majority of the money under management in managed futures strategies have been trend following by nature. So sometimes this gets a little bit confusing, but for me, I keep it right at the strategy conversation. And the strategy conversation is trend following. Now, in academic works, you might hear this called time series momentum, different than cross-sectional momentum. 
two kinds of momentum, time series, cross-sectional. One has practitioners and track records going back decades. The other, a lot of academic work, but not as much real-time track records. Makes for great stories, but for me, and what I want to get everybody into today is something that's real that you can wrap your arms around, which is trend following. Trend following is not this. If you're sitting at a desk doing this, you're not a trend following trader. I don't know what strategy it might be. It looks stressful as hell. If you're an investor and this is your trader, maybe it works out, maybe it doesn't. But hey, it's 2017, 18, coming into 2020 in a couple years. We do not need to be sitting at desks acting like we're pilots waiting for each tick to come along as human beings with a discretionary authority to pull the trigger. This can be all automated. Any strategy can be automated. If you can't write that strategy out, then you're just trusting one individual. Not the way to go in modern investing. So when you see this kind of picture here, look, I'm not going to say there's not folks out there that have made billions of dollars being the guy in that picture. But is it the exception? I sure think it is. Because ultimately, we don't know anything. We can't know anything. It's impossible. Look at Bitcoin. Everybody in the world's got an explanation for Bitcoin. And those explanations mean what? They don't mean anything. Nobody knows anything. The only thing we know about Bitcoin is that at the time we're kind of putting this together, it's around, I don't know, between 16 and 19,000. Who knows? In a short period of time, maybe it'll be at a million. Who knows? But there's no way to understand the why. And that gets back to trend following. My main subject today, you can't know why. David Ricardo cutting his losses. He's cutting his losses because he can't know why. All he can know is if the crowd is running and the crowd's going in a direction. If it's long, I want to be long. If it's short, I want to be short. That's some of the foundational thinking that goes into the topic of trend following. Now, I want to dig into some of the meat. I want to get you really thinking about the specifics of the strategy. Real simple, of course, these five questions that you're looking at right now. Selecting your portfolio, determining your position sizing, determining when you will enter, when you will exit with a win, exit with a loss. Those things take a little work. You got to sit down, you got to map it out. But conceptually, Everyone for every strategy has to have these five points figured out. First off, what are you going to trade? Are you going to trade one market? One market alone? Is that your cup of tea? One market alone leaves out a lot of opportunities. And that gets back to Paul Tudor Jones' comment that I posted on the screen a moment ago. This illusion to know why. The illusion to have a fundamental reason for why something is happening. That is an illusion. So why not just stick with the idea that we can't know? And if you can't know, why not trade everything? That means a super diversified portfolio. That means as a trend following trader, you're going to trade literally everything. Grains, metals, indices, interest rates. Remember, this is not about fundamental information. And this is not the typical stuff you will see when they bring somebody out on CNBC or Bloomberg that tells you this squiggly line moving in this direction equals this to happen next, or the Hindenburg open is going to happen next. No, 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 no. Sure, something like the Hindenburg omen could be your entry signal. That could be the signal that gets you into a trade from a trend volume perspective. But there's no predictive value in that. 
that starts to get to be where it's a little interesting with trying to understand trend following trading because there is no predictive value. You take a position in trend following, you take a trade, something, a moving average crossover, a breakout, a highest high of X days gets you into whatever market you're tracking. Do you know what's going to happen next? Of course not. You have no clue. You don't have to have a clue. You just ride the trend. If you're going to ride that trend and you have limited capital, that gets to our point number two right here, the how much question. How much are you going to trade? Probably everyone listening right now knows where I'm going with that. Position sizing is terribly important. Now, it can't make a losing system become a winning system, but position sizing keeps you in the game to play another day. And it puts you in a position that when you do have the trend going your way, you can really hit the bankroll. Now, of course, when do you buy or sell? I mean, when do you enter? When do you enter long? When do you enter short? You got to have that down. You got to know. Again, it could be something simple. It's got to be applied religiously. You can't just jump in and out, not really have a reason. Again, this is not, as I showed earlier, sitting at the screen with 15 monitors. You don't want to be that guy. You want to have these rules rigidly composed, put forth in a plan, executed. No equivocation. Boom. You stick with it. Now, you're going to see in a, a few moments here the idea of getting out of a trend. Because let's face it, trend following. I mean, what is trend following? Trend following just means you're going to have this portfolio of markets that you're tracking. You are going to know how much you're going to bet on any trade you get with your limited capital. What is the position size you will take? When will you enter? And when will you exit with a loss? When will you exit with a gain? People might laugh, but really it's this simple. If the market's going up, you're long. If the market's going down, you're either out or you're short. And back to the point that I was making a, a second ago, if you look at this here, your trend following trade, your typical trend following trade, and again, think portfolio here. Think portfolio. You can't do this on one market alone. This has to be a portfolio structure. So on a typical long signal, you're not getting in at the exact bottom. And you're not getting out at the exact top. You're getting out after a peak. You're looking for the middle meat of the trade. That's the whole point. It's very counterintuitive. I mean, I give a lot of props to the pioneers, the engineers that came early on in this field. Names that many of you may recognize from the Ed Sakotas to the Bill Dunn's the Richard Dennis's, the David Harding's, the Martin Luke's, newer guys like John Philippe Bouchot. All of these names have really, really, really helped all of us to understand how successful this trading strategy can be. A little more technical here. Sometimes you'll hear with trend following, it's got the option profile. And it is. You know, you take your entry here, you've got your fixed stop. You know how much you're willing to lose from the very first moment. In fact, you have to know how much you're willing to lose before you ever get in. No guessing here. And back to the Ricardo thing, the Ricardo line from the 1700s. Here it is right here. That's let your profits run. So this is a great chart from a trend following trader named Paul Mulvaney. Fantastically interesting track record that you should check out. Always educational to look at trend following track records so much information embedded in the monthly data of trend following traders. And you can see that. I mean, a lot of the published performance, a great report that everyone should check out from AQR, takes trend following trading back 100 years. Jean-Philippe Bouchot at CFM, he takes trend following back 200 years. Larry Height's firm, ISAM, they go back 800 years. I mean, maybe this is overkill to show that this very robust strategy that's been around for such a long time 
The people have gone back and reverse engineered and figured out with the commodity data, the financial data that we have going back nearly a thousand years, that you can recreate trend following performance. And why is this? It's because human beings are crazy. We push markets up and we push markets down. I mean, let's stop for a second and think about Bitcoin. I mean, even if Bitcoin never got above 17,000, who cares? Who cares if it went back to zero? If it goes up to a million, does it really make a difference if it's real or not real? I mean, fundamentally, I'm speaking as a fundamentalist for a moment. Fundamentally, I like the idea, hey, this, this great cryptocurrency that can slow down you know, central banks. But it's not an investment. It's a trade. And it's a trade there for everyone. And that applies to all markets. And that's what's so cool about trend following is you don't have to be an expert in anything to jump in. So as a trend following trader, you do your homework, you put your rules together, you launch the system, and you go. You're not an expert in Bitcoin. You're not an expert in gold. You don't have any clue about coffee or cocoa or palladium or platinum. None. But they're all markets that you can trade. Absolutely all markets that you can trade. And I love this side by side here. Because what we're really going for with trend following trading is you're trying to find the home run. You're trying to be Babe Ruth. You know you're going to strike out seven out of 10 times. You know seven out of 10 times you're going to take a trade, this trend following approach that has no predictive ability, not based on fundamentals. We're basically playing blackjack. We're playing venture capital here. That's the strategy. We're going to end up with a lot of small losses. But we're looking for the home runs. See, I look at the tulip bulb craze that everyone likes to look back and talk about, a famous bubble. Okay, it's a famous bubble. A lot of people got burned. What about the people that made a fortune? What about the people that had a trading strategy predicated on bubbles? Meaning they were willing to ride the bubble out and had a set place where they could get off. Of course, no one times the top. But it's the guy that rides it all the way back to zero. There's nothing to learn there. But that's what history does. History fixates us on the people that ride it back to zero. That's not the point. The point is who trades these great events. And I love this picture. Nicholas Darvis. I forget the exact book. How I Made $2 Million. Trend following trader. A dancer from back in the day. This isn't new. It's not new at all. It's just rediscovered by new audiences at new times. Now, I'm sure there's going to be some skeptics, some critics, and they'll say, you know, this doesn't work. This can't work. Covell, you've drunk the Kool-Aid. Forget it. Trend following's dead. And I always just think, okay, fair enough. Fair point. This stuff is all nonsense. Then let's just have a little conversation about Bill Dunn's 40 plus year track record. 40 plus years. At right around 18% after his fees. That's pretty amazing. There's no doubt. There's volatility in his performance. If you're going to play this game, this trend following game where you can't predict a damn thing and you're going to take small losses. And there's going to be trendless periods in the past and trendless periods in the future. And so if you have a non-predictive strategy where you're willing to take an entry, not knowing where that market's going to go, boom, small loss. Boom, small loss. You could have a couple years of small losses. The next thing you know, you have a 50% drawdown. Oh, okay. Now I know here it comes. Covell, you're talking about a 50% drawdown with a trading strategy. Well, yeah, guess what? 
If you want to get absolute returns, large returns, if you want to end up with 18% a year after 40 plus years, a track record that everyone can look at the month by month, you're going to take risk. And oh, by the way, if you just want to compare to a buy and hold index, you're going to take risk there too. But twice in the last 18 years, the S&P has dropped 50%. The NASDAQ dropped 77%. I look back to 1973, 1974, the Charlie Munger partnership, a little kind of pre-Warren Buffett, he was down 30% back-to-back years. And Buffett himself is fond of saying, if you're in the markets and you can't afford to lose 50%, if you're not prepared to lose 50%, even if it's on paper, you shouldn't be in the markets. Now, if one of the richest, most successful players albeit not a trend-following trader, if one of the richest, most successful players says, you can't be in the market if you're not willing to lose 50%, isn't there something to be learned there? Now, just for giggles the other day, I posted on my Facebook, I said something to the effect of what happens to you, what do you do if your trading strategy is down 5% after year one? Oh my gosh, you would have thought people have never seen a 5% drop before. Why change the system? Something's wrong. I mean, panic time. 5% means nothing. Down 5% in one year means nothing. I don't care the strategy. In fact, every strategy has to have embedded in it for the long term, the ability to have at least the 5% drawdown and probably a lot more than that. So anyone that comes at you and says, yeah, I got only positive performance. I never even have a 5% drawdown. I just, okay, you know what? Some people are going to believe that. More power to them. Now, again, when you look at that done chart, he's getting those drawdowns, those deep blue drawdowns. He's getting that because that diversified portfolio of all those different markets, you get trendless periods. He's cutting his losses. He cuts his losses. Cut your losses for a couple years, trendless periods, boom, there's where your drawdown comes from. Why does this work? Now, you've probably already guessed. The convergence side here, this is the typical way that the majority thinks. Many small wins and extreme losses, kind of like fall 2008. Oh, October of 2008, a month where trend followers killed it. Now, on the other side, you have the trend following strategy. Many small losses and extreme gains. This is the choice. I'm not here to beat you up to tell you which side you should be on. But this side over here, not a lot of people think about it. They don't spend a lot of headspace there. They don't allow themselves to go here. This is not something Wall Street sells a lot of. Now, albeit, guys like AQR, David Harding at Winton Capital... They've raised billions upon billions of dollars, but it's still small potatoes. Small potatoes are in the trend-following fund space compared to everything else. It's just tiny. And one of the reasons for it, Nobel Prize winner Eugene Fama, he's come out and he said, when it comes to something like a moving average, a foundational element in trend following, ancient tale with no empirical support. You know, I go back to this. That's 40 plus years of data. A trader has been living and breathing it for 40 plus years. Very few people know about, and he's not the only track record. This is not an issue of survivorship bias. There are plenty, plenty of trend following track records for those to that want to examine closely. But I think it's an interesting contrast that you have on one side an academic who has essentially helped lay the foundation for all of the financial textbooks. And he's willing to say an ancient tale. And I say, hey, hold on, professor. Let's talk about Bill Dunn's 40-year track record. Let's talk about... David Harding's 30 plus year track record. Let's go through each month. Let's find out the trades they took, why they took them. Let's reverse engineer it 
Let's have that conversation. And of course, the academics have all come. I think it's fair to say all. The academics have all come to believe that momentum does exist. And they define momentum two ways, cross-sectional, relative strength, and time series, which is trend following. So they have grudgingly come over to the side. And trend followers are on the Daniel Kahneman side. What a great story. I say to people, hey, you want to know more about trend following? Go read Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. You will now know the psychological foundation of why trend following works. It's right there in black and white from the most prominent living psychologist alive. I think the only psychologist to win a Nobel Prize in econ. It's quite clear. We're all nuts. Human beings are nuts. We're not going to get any less nuts. And Bitcoin's a fantastic reminder about how nuts we can be. That doesn't mean I'm saying the price of Bitcoin going up is right or wrong. I have no idea. But clearly, it's not only a rational move. It's a rock and roll, rocket to the moon move. And it sure seems to go a lot more in line with David Ricardo, who I mentioned early in this presentation, or Daniel Kahneman. A lot more so than Eugene Fama. Again, you're going to have to do your homework. You're going to have to decide where you sit. How do you feel about these different competing viewpoints? And I feel like the one thing that I've done in the last 20 years to add value is to really accentuate these trend-following track records, these data points that very, very, very few people look at. I seriously doubt you can go to a college classroom and find Bill Dunn's track record anywhere. But wouldn't that be a fantastic semester-long project? Sit down with students today, 2017, 2018, throw down a 20, 30, 40-year trend-following track record, and say, okay, we're going to figure out how these numbers came to be. And then we can make decisions. We can say, okay, what happens if we dialed the risk back? What happens if we crank the risk up? What happens if we had a more diversified portfolio? What if we follow less instruments? The testing process can start to really unfold. And the cool thing about this is that anyone can do this. There's no limitation. This idea that you were born with it, you're a born trader. I mean, everyone knows the famous story of the turtles. I happen to have a book on that subject as well. But this gentleman on the screen, one of my favorites, Anders Ericsson, a professor at Florida State University, he's the guy that figured out the deliberate practice. You put the time in on any subject, you can dominate. I think it's worth bringing him up in the context of something like this because whether you're listening and you're thinking to yourself, I want to take a stab at being a trend-following trader or I want to invest with a trend-following trader, the key is just gathering knowledge and gathering information. And there's no limitation there except your willingness to do it. Another guy that I love, Alan Watts, introduced Zen Buddhism to the West. Fantastic videos on YouTube. And it's all about the moment of now. What decision are you going to make right now? Because you can't control anything else. You can control right now. That's trend following. Trend following is, I can make a decision right now. I know, here's my portfolio. Here are my entry rules. Here are my exit rules. Here's how much I'm willing to bet. I can control that right now. I can't control anything else. I can't control a central bank. I can't control the market. I can't demand, as I said at the very beginning of this presentation, I can't demand that the market give me money. I'm in the moment of right now, and that's all I have. Again, I seriously doubt that Alan Watts is ever introduced in any financial class, CFA, anywhere is he introduced and his thought process put on the table. But for traders, for those that are looking to make money, brilliant. 
Absolutely brilliant. Now, of course, everything I've said today, I mean, you know, I like to think of myself, I'm the guy over here with the two wheels. But most people are too busy. They're too busy. I mean, so much of the world is predicated on an index strategy. So much of the world is predicated on essentially buy and hold mutual funds. And you have to decide, do you really want that style only? I don't want it at all. But do you only want that style alone? Because what trend following does, let's say you are the index investor, or let's say you're the up and coming trend following trader and you want to offer a new product. Trend following is not correlated with anything. When you trade a trend following portfolio, a time series momentum portfolio, the return stream is not correlated to anything like the S&P index. And everyone listening knows by now when you add an uncorrelated stream in with something else, you end up with a little more performance and a little less risk. It's a no-brainer. But what I love about this subject, this trend-following subject, is only so many people come along for the journey. And everybody gets what they want out of this whole process from Ed Sakota, And this happens to be a picture, a very fun event that I did years back with Ed Sakota and Larry Height. But this is a line from Sakota, and I'm kind of paraphrasing it and taking it in a slightly different direction. But everybody gets what they want. If everybody wants to, or anybody wants to be an index investor waiting for their next 50% drawdown, hoping that their index doesn't end up looking like the Nikkei over the next 30 years, flat, they're getting exactly what they want. If people don't want to investigate a new trading strategy or go down that path, you're getting exactly what you want. If you do want to investigate it, you're getting what you want. I love that piece from Sakota. And look, what's going to really be fun at some point in the future, and I'm swiping from Nassim Talib, when the next black swan rolls in, and there will always be another one, there might be one next week. There might be one next month. There might be none. I can't make any prediction. And anyone that tells you they can make a prediction, well, you might want to really see if your wallet is still in your back pocket. It's probably been lifted, picked, and you've been cleaned out. But I love this picture. I think it's from Whiskey Rebellion in Pennsylvania, 1700s. You think back to the feelings that we all had in the fall of 2008. Last time there was a crisis period. There'll be another crisis period. I can't tell you when. The question for you, though, are you prepared? Do you have something thought out that's not just like everyone else? Because, again, you've got a choice here. You've 100% got a choice. My presentation today, I'm trying to give you some food for thought, some different paths to go down that one choice is absolutely trend following. And I would most appreciate if you checked out my newest edition of Trend Following. Out in 2017, 220,000 words. This is the fifth edition of my Trend Following book. It sold well over 100,000 copies. It has absolutely made a dent in the thought process out there. I went through this, even if you had an old edition, I went through this, expanded it by 100,000 words, literally improved, rewrote every damn sentence in there. So I think if you did happen to have an older copy, I think you will thoroughly enjoy this hardcover. And oh, also the audiobook for this is out. 34 hours, you can drive clear across America and not listen to anything except trend following. So I appreciate you taking some time to listen today. I hope I've spurred some thoughts some different avenues for investigation that you can go down. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'm easy to find, trendfollowing.com. My email is even easier. My first name at my last name, michael at covell.com. I see a time when those awake 
will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.